And we also have a uh, number on the screen. That's good. This is going to come back. Okay. Now uh, that we have a quorum, I think it's safe to start. I want to welcome you very warmly to uh, the UN House. Uh, we have uh, guests from many different corners of the community supporting uh, nature and climate, uh, not only here in the room, but we also have a very large group on screen. So it may look a little bit skewed, but uh, uh, at the moment there are more than 50. And uh, hello, Carla, I see you. Good to see you. Uh, and uh, we expect this to grow in course of the meeting, and probably there will also be a few more trickling in as we get started. For those who don't uh, or haven't been to the UN House before, I just want to welcome you to this uh, venue where we are 14, uh, no, 15 agencies now in the building out of the 27 UN agencies that uh, reside here in Brussels. And uh, today there are uh, a few of us uh, participating in this event. Uh, so uh, thank you for taking the time uh, to come to uh, discuss this very important issue. Uh, as you all know, there is the Sustainable Development Goals Summit next week, which marks the midpoint of the 2030 agenda. And at a time where the impacts of our exploitation of the planet are now in plain sight. <laughs> Much of the Northern Hemisphere has recently endured the highest land and ocean temperatures even re ever recorded, and de de ever devastating wildfires and catastrophic floods are daily news from all over the world. In Libya, India, Ethiopia, Algeria, Greece, Hong Kong, Japan, the list doesn't stop. And this is not just a, a climate issue, it is a, a biodiversity combined uh, climate uh, challenge that we have to address. At the, at the same time, we also see severe uh, water shortages affecting uh, countries in um, South Africa to Uruguay and with more than 1.1 billion people lacking reliable access uh, to water and 2.7 billion people now experiencing uh, water scarcity at least uh, once one month a year. So the, the, the painting of the picture is clear. We, we uh, have to act urgently. So this is why uh, we have the pleasure of uh, putting this uh, on the highest priority uh, of the agenda today. And we would like to thank the EU for their strong commitment through uh, the European Green Deal uh, and mentoring, uh, I mean, the, the global community to uh, take more action, showing the example, showing the way, and uh, <clears throat> uh, with examples such as this uh, EU sustainability reporting standards, the EU deforestation, uh, free production regulation, the taxonomy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The list is long, and especially in the recent years, you have made a big push, and we hope uh, to see this continuing into a new commission. Uh, from uh, 24 uh, onwards. On that note, I want to hand over to my colleague uh, Francine and uh, the team from UNDP to introduce uh, the Native Pledge and then over to the panel to uh, shed light on the various aspects of uh, this very important subject. Over to you, Sandri. Oh, Francine, sorry. <laughs> Christine. No, 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 no. It's, uh, All right. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everybody, welcome, welcome online. It's good to see you all, good to see you here. I'm Francine, I'm the moderator for today. Um, I'm working in UNDP's Policy and Partnership Bureau. I'm here this week uh, from New York. Um, so let's let's get stuck in. Um, I want this to be a really it is for the audio in the for those participating online. So if you can take the mic, okay. can you hear you? Oh, you can hear. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Colleagues, if you can't hear me online, please send us a message. Um, 
But um, uh, Camilla mentioned the SDG summit that's starting basically on Saturday. Um, and I just wanted to, to open with a sort of reference to UNDP's flagship uh, report, which we launched for this summit uh, yesterday or no, Tuesday. Um, we, in, in the space of two or three months, produced 95 reports working with 95 different countries around the world who really look, use AI, use the take the national plans from these countries, use all the data available to see what they're doing on the SDGs. Um, and the findings were um, very interesting. Their findings were the kind of development kind of development that we want, that's development that is about the planet and the people together, is not the development we're getting. The development we're getting, uh, the development that countries are, um, are moving with is, is crisis response, crisis mitigation. It's uh, driven by fossil fuels and it's financed through debt. Um, if you look at those 95 countries uh, whose reports we launched uh, earlier this, this week, um, 70, 72 out of those 95 countries saw their carbon emissions increase. Four out of five of those countries saw poverty levels stagnate or increase. So the kind of growth that we're getting is, is not the kind of growth that we want. And it's not the kind of growth that is reducing poverty and, and good for, uh, for the environment. So, but there are, some, there are some entry points, there are some good news, there, there is some good news there too. The good news is that some of the SDGs that see the biggest interlinkages where most work is happening, are entry points for us to be working on the green agenda and green transition. So for example, resilient infrastructure, sustainable cities, effective governance. These are the goals where we see the most interlinkages, but they're also the entry points for us to push forward on SDG 14 and SDG 15. So, so these, these are the opportunities and we have seven years to work together in partnership to try and you know, accelerate and move forward on the goals, that, on, on, on these two goals. That's the first thing I wanted to say. Now, we're happy to be here in Brussels this week. We're happy right now here to be using this event to, to launch our nature pledge. Our nature pledge is UNDP's promise our commitment on how we want to tackle nature, partly through the $3.2 billion projects and programs that we have within UNDP, but uh, on nature and biodiversity, but actually for us, it's a commitment to, to make sure that nature is addressed through all our development work, not just our work in nature. So we're working through through this in 142 countries. We're upscaling and and we're committed to to taking it to the next level. Now we see three key shifts. I'm just going to mention them really fast. Three key shifts as important for that transformation to happen. One is a behavioral shift, and I really hope we discuss this today. How do we get beyond this idea of trade offs that uh, that it, somehow there is economic growth and there is nature and these are separate tracks. So how do we shift behavior uh, on that, uh, shift attitudes and beliefs? That's the first transformation we need. The second is in our economic and financial systems. How can we turn things around so that business sees nature as foundational and is accountable for their impact uh, and contribution to, to nature? How do we change business models so that nature is at the core of what they do? And then the third shift that we're talking about is about policy and practice. How can countries uh, and, and political leaders, governments, uh, lead that work to implement, to implement change? That is, 
to implement the commitments that have been made in the biodiversity framework agreement signed in December last year. So how can we turn that ambition into action at the country level? So these are the three shifts that, that we are talking about. So today's discussion is really exciting because we want to hear the ideas, the ideas that are coming out of uh, innovative ways of working, like we're going to hear from Zambia shortly, but also how uh, partners, because we have to work on this together, partners within the EU through the Green Deal, partners in other sister agencies like the UN and others, um, how we can, what are our strategies, what are our tactics for, you know, for making this change happen, these three shifts happen. So the title of today's discussion is no more trade-offs, naivety or imperative towards a more sustainable, equitable and inclusive future. So again, this goes back to the idea that somehow uh, nature and, and, and economy are different tracks and are, and somehow that economy is, got to get the economy right first and then nature's something nice to, to come later. So nature seen as a bit of a, a luxury or or something that comes after the ec economic growth. So how do we how do we challenge that idea? And what what are the strategies um, to really to ensure that decision makers at the country level, at the global level, uh, can move beyond this idea and see how nature and people people and and, and economy actually need to mutually enforce each other. So we have a really exciting panel today. I'm just going to introduce them briefly and then, and then kick off with some questions. And we have two rounds of questions today. And I, um, after each round of questions, we've got such a great participation and audience. I'm going to open the floor up for questions. Um, so if you have questions and you're online, we'll give you the opportunity to raise your hand. But if you want to write your question, um, in the chat, plot, chat box, please do so. And then colleagues here uh, in person, please please raise your hand. So we'll try and have two uh, rounds of, of Q&A as well. Um, so uh, to introduce the panel, first we have uh, Mutumboy Mundia, former director of market supervision, uh, market supervision and Development Securities and Exchange Commission in Zambia and now the CEO of Prospero Limited. So she's joining us online from Zambia. Then we have uh, Yanis Potocznik, uh, who uh, is member of the Club of Rome and is doing some other interesting work that I hope you'll discuss. Uh, we have Ms. Astrid Schumacher, um, Director of the Green Diplomacy and Multilateralism at the European Commission's DG for Environment. We have Carla Montesi online as well, Director for Green Deal, Digital Agenda and European Commission's DG for International Partnerships. We have Thierry Lucas, UN UNEP's Coordinator for Biodiversity in Europe and Midori Pax Paxson who leads UNDP's Nature Hub in New York. So, panelists, please keep your intervention short three minutes if possible, so that we can have sufficient time for the Q&A. Uh, and co uh, colleagues in the audience, please, please think through your questions. So I'm gonna start with Yanis. Um, and look at turning to you as an economist, uh, a root cause of biodiversity loss and rapidly deteriorating ecosystem services is that the economic and financial calculus ignores the value of biodiversity and ecosystem services and misses out on addressing environmental externalities to our fiscal systems. So what needs to be done to change the current status quo, the current economic paradigm? Please. Thank you. It's great to be here and uh, thank you, Francine. Uh, first, there are many who believe that nature should not be priced because it has intrinsic value and it's hard to not agree with that. But on the other hand, uh, it is also quite important to understand that, uh, and again, everybody agrees about that, that valuing nature is important. Unfortunately, 
in the market system, which is prevailing, of course, and I don't see another alternative system for for C for, for some time. We have a price for nature currently, and that's for print. So uh, that's actually the price which is paid by the business sector. <clears throat> and of course, this has consequences. And uh, this, uh, of course, has uh, pretty much consequences how we value it. And in many cases, you will see that repairing something, it's simply more costly than actually taking things from nature. And uh, these are, of course, not good trends. Uh, the Scutta review, which was about economics of biodiversity, was clear about that fact. But when it was trying to address what is the core problem, it was basically saying that, uh, uh, first of all, the governance systems, which I think we could easily agree. But the second is that contemporary economics is looking to humans as external to nature and not as part of the nature. And by the way, your question, which your, your, your point, which you addressed at the beginning, so how to, how to actually, that there are two tracks, nature and economics, is emerging exactly from that point of view. Yes. So I would never say, for example, uh, we people, planet, uh, and, uh, and environment, because immediately you, you say, people are not part of the environment, we are part of the environment, and destroying environment is actually basically destroying ourselves. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we are starting to understand that, but we are not yet there. Mm -hmm. So market signals which we are sending to consumers and producers by ascension. Mm -hmm. And currently what we are saying, uh, sending to producers, it's, uh, it's somehow, um, if you don't value nature, you will be rewarded. Mm -hmm. And what we are saying to consumers, and you said yourself, we have to look to behavioral story and so on. We have to look to the question how responsibly we as consumers uh, act. But of course, if you will act responsibly, you will pay more. So in economic uh, language, which I, uh, because I'm also a professor of economics, it would mean be stupid because everything else it's uh, it's, uh, it's it's not consistent with protecting the environment. So there are three basic bottlenecks which needs to be addressed. One is uh, we need to look to the problems in more comprehensive way. So connect the dots. Second, the second bottleneck was we are not going enough deep to the drivers and pressures, mm -hmm. to the natural resource use uh, questions, to the questions which are linked to the uh, to the economic signals. And finally, mm -hmm. uh, we are trying to solve the story through the supply side. We are not questioning the, uh, the, 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 the way that we have created a wasteful economic system, which is totally unfair at the same time, and not looking to that, and not looking in particular in Western part of the world in the mirror and ask ourselves who is actually breaching the planetary boundaries will not do the trick. So cleaning the supply side, it's important and necessary, but it's essential that we look also on the demand side. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, great. So now I'm gonna turn to Mutumboy. Uh, welcome. It's lovely to have you with us. And uh, Zambia is a pioneer. I'm looking at you here. Zambia is a is a pioneer in in mainstreaming green finance into the country's financial sector, with green bond guidelines uh, and listing rules already having been gazetted. How is the country, including the financial regulators, uh, such as the Security and Exchange Commission, for which you were the director and the central bank? See, seeing investment in nature as a means of tackling multiple development challenges that confront your country. Over to you. And please try and keep your answer short. I will try. And uh, thank you very much for um, inviting me to participate in this very, very important panel. And just maybe suffices also that I really emphasize that um, I'm, I'm, I'm on the panel in a different heart. I've since left my job at the Securities and Exchange Commission to yet another exciting job that still keeps me 
um, very much in touch with uh, what the broader agenda is around sustainability. So I like also some of the remarks that you made uh, earlier in terms of um, um, some potential debates around this thing, trying to distinguish between nature and um, the economy. So for countries like uh, Zambia, I think we, we have it slightly easier in the sense that um, it's very uh, intertwined and it's very easy once uh, we are intentional about uh, explaining um, uh, the sustainability agenda. It's very easy to do that because we fend off nature. We, the country is, is still uh, experiencing high levels of poverty. And what that means is the majority of our citizens in the rural places are fending off nature. So the economic activities such as agriculture would, would mean that we're depending on um, rain and uh, we can see the adverse effects. Um, we also are depending on cheap sources of energy uh, in terms of charcoal. And effectively that has also an adverse effect on, 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 on nature. So it, it's pretty easier to not labor on that sort of a debate in an economy as ours uh, versus maybe some of those um, industrialized economies. So I think what then remains a key challenge is um, awareness and basically sensitizing the masses in terms of how some of the existing practices as we carry on um, fending for ourselves have an adverse effect on nature. And as the financial sector um, um, at the time, and I know the agenda, the, the, the motivation continues, we did take um, a deliberate um, um, choice of uh, giving leadership to the aspect of needing to catalyze how we transition Zambia into um, a green economy. And uh, so we prioritized um, the need for putting in place frameworks that would first and foremost encourage the financial sector to adopt um, uh, sustainable development goals and to literally change some of their practices. But importantly, also we prioritize the need to have the right framework, such as the green bonds uh, uh, framework that you spoke about and ongoing is the green loans framework because we do recognize that uh, we sit at the core of the engine of, of transition in the, the economy in the sense that um, financing is crucial to uh, shifting um, shifting the practices, the business practices to more sustainable business practices. So whereas uh, we think um, the shifting of the mindset is a little easier once um, the message is explained in terms of um, how adverse some of those practices are, as I mentioned, like uh, burning, uh, putting down of our forest to, to create charcoal. It's, it, it becomes, um, the, 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 the sticking point would basically now be, how do we then uh, facilitate for that transition? And we have given leadership um, as uh, a former financial sector regulator and still continuing to work with the financial sector um, in that sense. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ntumboy. So we've heard about the importance of market signals and we've heard from Zambia that actually people live more in alignment with nature uh, in that country than perhaps in some other industrialized countries, which is, which is very interesting. So Astrid, um, over to you um, as director of EC's DG for Environment. How are you dealing with this argument about trade-offs between economic and environmental issues within the EU um, and in terms of some of these very progressive regulations that you're now moving forward with? Yeah, thanks a lot, Francine, and thanks a lot to UNDP and UNIP for organizing this event. It's, it's really important that we can have that, that conversation. Well, coming to this issue of trade-offs, I'm going to cover mostly the governance angle, which hasn't been covered so far. And uh, in many ways, I would say at this point in time, nature is doing our bidding because yes, the trade-offs, uh, people like to ignore them, but uh, if you look at the news, uh, it is quite obvious what living on a hot planet or boiling planet looks like mm -hmm. and how this actually underpins the very basis for the economic activity. And in particular, those that like to 
talk about traders, do that uh, for vested interests to protect certain industries. And I think it is becoming increasingly clear that is a bit of optimistic perspective one can still have that, uh, in fact, uh, making this argument undermines the very basis on which their own industries often live on. So what I think it takes in particular, what we're trying to do with the European Green Deal are a couple of things. First of all, I think it really takes top level leadership. And here I just want to mention yesterday, we had our State of the Union address and the European Union Commission President being extremely clear about the value of nature. It was almost the first argument um, she made and saying very clearly biodiversity, ecosystem services are vital for all of us in Europe. The loss of nature destroys not only the foundations of our life, but also our feeding of what constitutes so. So that is the thinking behind it. Now, how are we going to, how are we turning this into action? So the Green Deal wants to disprove the argument of uh, there being trade-offs and want to make, wants to explain that in developing ambitious climate and environment policy, there is in fact a lot of economic opportunity and a lot of job creation potential. Mm -hmm. And if I just mention a few examples, not as many as I would like, but I can find the show. Um, take, of course, the most visible output of the Green Deal, our Fit for 55 uh, package, so climate neutrality by 2050, 55% reduction of emissions by 2030. So, of course, everybody in industry was initially very, very concerned about how, what that would mean for them, if they remain concerned, and why do so? This is about changing fundamentally their business model. But what we have seen is that the sort of net zero ecosystem that was worth over 100 billion in 2021 had doubled its value um, since 2022. So we see this innovation kick in and we see the, we see the job opportunities come. And of course, that needs to be supported as we do with the Just Transition Fund, as we do also in the, um, with the Net Zero Industry Act. Second example I want to make on nature, biodiversity strategy and nature restoration. The biodiversity strategy has been setting out targets that have been of concern to the agriculture community. It speaks about uh, protecting 30% of US land and seas, reduction of pesticide use in this by 50%, and having at least 25% of agricultural land under organic farming management. So, especially when the Ukraine, uh, the Russia's war in Ukraine kicked in, food security concerns were brought up, and people were saying, we cannot do all this because that threatens food security. And of course, it does not. The contrary is uh, is the case, and we have done a study on that at the beginning of 2023, and that has actually identified that it is the current high input intensive agricultural model based on the chemical pesticides um, that poses the food security threat, and that a different agricultural model um, actually ensures uh, the longevity of our industry and uh, and a much better in the, the agriculture yield over the long term. Same for the nature restoration or lots of concerns. But if you look at it, ultimately the benefits outweigh the cost by a factor of one to eight. And that is a message we're very actively um, wanting to, uh, to com communicate and are actively communicating. So I will cut uh, a lot of other things. I, I wanted to say maybe just uh, to conclude with the important behavioral aspect that, uh, that you have been mentioning. And I think there, this is a little bit the weak spot, I think, of global action, uh, including in the European Union and elsewhere, this understanding of what triggers behavior. Mm -hmm. Having behavioral scientists involved in discussion, I think, is something we need to do better globally and in the EU. And lastly, of course, we're doing nice things in the European Union. What we have to do is translate that into global action. The Green Deal has a small international chapter. My personal wish for the next commission is that we say Green Deal needs to go global, needs to go global. Mm -hmm. and, and that we team up even more with the colleagues from INPA, the industry panel, panel yes. trade uh, and the external action service to sort of tell the stories, tell what we have learned as lessons and find ways of translating our lessons into action. Also. Thank you very much, Astrid. And that is a perfect segue uh, mm -hmm. into Carla. Uh, Carla is from the EC's International Partnerships uh, uh, Division, and so, um, as Astrid was saying, um, how do you see the European Green Deal uh, contributing uh, to global biodiversity framework beyond Europe's borders? So, with uh, in other countries, please over to you. Um, many, many thanks. And um, I would say, uh, Francine, very pleased to be with, uh, with, uh, with you today. And uh, 
I think just to mention the essential, uh, the European Green Deal, it's, 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 it's not just a, a domestic agenda. It set ambitious goals uh, from climate neutrality, halting and reversing biodiversity loss, but it's a global agenda because no region on the, of the world can solve it if in or, on its own. So we need really to work together. And this is why the standard agenda is uh, an an intrinsic part of, of the, the Green Deal. Uh, we have many policies that, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, from the deforestation regulation, from the carbon border adjustment mechanism for the corporate to sustainable due diligence, from the farm to fork, the UB diversity strategy, that of course are very, very important uh, in Europe, but clearly have an impact on external, on external action. And this is why we need really to ensure the interoperability of the evolving European sustainable finance framework that is very, very important. We are establishing two key uh, global initiatives. First is the European Sustainable Finance Hub, which will support the partner countries, once again, on demand, to develop a sustainable finance framework. And the second that was just mentioned uh, by Mundia is the, also the European Global Green Bond Initiative that will allow to unlock new sources of uh, financing for the biodiversity in partner countries. Uh, I will say that uh, last year we have revised our wildlife trafficking action plan. We clearly are supporting a network of uh, courageous civil society actors uh, as well as the International Consortium to Combat Wildlife uh, Crime. Um, on the policy and on the external impact, I will say we will have the deforestation regulation that, of course, will involve new requirements for certain commodities. It's assured that we will be there to support our partner countries to better protect, restore, conserve, cons conserve the forest in with the forest partnership, but also working together with partners really on the sustainable supply chain on the food system. So clearly the our global gateway strategy that has as an objective clearly accelerated the green and the digital transition in a team Europe approach, we will have to try to mobilize investment that investment that will have a positive benefit for for nature and in all this of course we will have clearly to join force and in our view the global gateway will be really uh, our effort to deliver clearly on the global biodiversity framework so it's clearly a joint work looking to the green deal once again not just as an internal policy but it's clearly an external policy shedding our ambition with our partners thank you Over so much you. thank you so much carla um and, and great that you mentioned the global gateway at the end uh friends and colleagues in the audience uh we're going to have two more speakers uh give their uh thoughts so Please start writing your questions in the chat box. Uh, we're monitoring those and, and collecting those. And uh, if you've got questions in your head, start uh, finessing them. So we're going to turn turn to you for, for Q and A shortly. So let me finally turn to uh, my my two colleagues, uh, Thierry and, and Midori. Um, I mean, what evidence are you seeing um, to dismantle this notion of trade offs? And what progress are you seeing in implementing the biodiversity framework? So uh, let me start with you. Well, I mean, I'd like to first to start by the fact that we are better now than we were 10 years ago when, and, and we are discussing nature issues, biodiversity loss, but we are far from being there in terms of the work we need to do at, at UNDP and you have been advocates. So that's why I'm, I'm pleased to, to have Yanesh with us, because, I mean, we are supporting the Commission, the International Resource Panel, and, and we need more initiatives like that. So if you read the, the, the report from International Resource Panel, you will read, for example, that 90% of biodiversity loss is linked with extraction of minerals, mm -hmm. and is linked with our economic model, and in 10 years from now, we will double this extraction. So that's why action is needed, but action is needed also on, on the way we envision and we communicate about what is economic growth and what's important. 
because it's great to have someone from, from Zambia, it's great to have a representative from South Africa. We have a perception in every single country which is different from the perception in, in other parts of the world. And the first thing we have to do, and that I'm great about the initiative you're launching, UNDP, we have to fit with what is happening in each and every country. So you were saying that at your last point, we need to connect the dots. We need to connect the dots with education. Young people are not aware of, about the, the issues they are facing, and that's why there's the global issue of young generation and the fear about the climate change. And, and that we need to address. We need to reassure the younger generation because otherwise fear will drive us to even bigger issues, bigger problems. That, that's the first point. The second one is that I see that as small seeds in the ground starting to just go out of the soil. Mm -hmm. We need to water those seeds where we know that's hope. We know a number of initiatives worldwide and the commission has worked perfectly well in, in Virunga. That's a perfect example of that if you put a lot of efforts, if you involve the society globally, at least you can preserve some of the ecosystems there and then you can find a, a future there. And you have other examples in, in some individual countries. So those issues we need to address. But the last point which is important is that working with the companies who are working with us, with some banks and insurance companies, we also need to address the ones who are not willing to take this pathway. So you were saying that as it on the governance aspects, what do we do to make sure that, well, there's a number of safe dogs, there's a number of new goods now, and, and we know the pay we the, the price we pay every day because of climate change, climate warming, and those issues, but it's not reflecting that in our way of living. Nature is for free. Mm -hmm. But what do we do with those financial institutions who have on purpose decided not to go on the way to go for climate change and for biodiversity? Brilliant. So I remember the green shoots that we need to water, the, the hope and the, the the entry points for change. I think that's a really important message. Midori. Thank you. I'd like to start by echoing Astrid. You know, to me also the trade-off argument has been used for so long and often deliberately uh, as an excuse, an excuse for inaction and to protect, you know, vested interest and, and so on. So how, because if you think about it, how can conservation of biodiversity or say conservation of forest that, you know, provide water for drinking, farming, and use for industries and or fertile soil or pollination services be a trade-off to economic development or rural or urban development. And so in our work, UNDP is working over 140 countries. There are a lot of evidence <laughs> to support this normal trade-off argument. And nature-based solution, for one, typically yields multiple benefits, including climate, food, water, security, health, poverty, eradication, job creation, and, and women and community empowerment. And nature-based solutions are also often very cost-effective. For example, uh, we have this video, two to five times more cost-effective when it comes to uh, coastal flood and erosion management compared to typical engineering solutions. And through our work in Colombia and Guatemala, for example, uh, we worked with coffee farmers and growers associations, and we are able to support a market increase in their income, farmers' income, at the same time, improving the production system so that the conservation of biodiversity is assured in their production landscape. And in Turkey, uh, our support for marine conservation area led to uh, an increase of local fish population by 800% and leading to a four-fold increase in the fishers, uh, fisher people's revenue. And even monk seal, some of you know the monk seal, Mediterranean monk seal population has come back and that's adding to the local uh, tourism attraction. And in Africa, I think Mutumboy also mentioned, uh, many countries are working to develop sustainable wildlife economy to reduce poverty and create jobs. And in the pre-COVID time, uh, more than 36% of tourism in Africa, tourism jobs 
in Africa were already wildlife tourism. And tourism is a very job intensive uh, sector and, uh, and, uh, and accounting for uh, one in 10 tourism jobs around the world. So this is quite significant. And the number of tourists in Africa or to Africa or in Africa uh, is projected to double by uh, 2030 compared to pre-COVID times. So there's a tremendous economic, uh, sustainable economic opportunities there. And I worked in Namibia for 10 years in the past. And in Namibia, we supported economic evaluation of the protected area system. And it came up with a figure, a return of investment in improving the park system uh, is, is as much as 24%. And because of the importance of tourism sector to, to the country's economy. And there are many other examples, but I try not to be too wrong. So there are uh, all these examples there, and that really shows this win-win solutions mm -hmm. are possible. And this all contributes to the global biodiversity framework. Implementation. Midori, good. So We've heard a lot in this first round of uh, sort of uh, questions to the panel about how actually nature and people are aligned. We've just heard a lot about that there is a financial in case for investing in nature, and yet we're seeing this acceleration of the destruction of nature. So it's an interesting um, uh, problem that we have. So colleagues, uh, Questions, please, for the panel, based on what you've heard so far. Um, and online, please raise your hand, your virtual hand, or or write your question in the chat box. We are we are monitoring that. Um, but there was a question over here, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Marisa Metznikova, and I am the community manager of uh, European Commission's platform Capacity for Deaf. And uh, I have a question regarding what uh, actually Mr. Potochnik uh, said that the price of the nature is free, uh, which uh, a bit puzzled me because uh, recently I was invited uh, to the Google's headquarters in London and uh, there was a reveal that actually Google should uh, recently establish a new filter in uh, the Google flights where actually we should be able to filter flights based on CO2. And uh, I have a question in this sense, uh, as also uh, Mrs. Pickup said about the business model and maybe like uh, how the young people uh, might be motivated. My question is uh, how we can actually uh, get to the point where the environment and the nature will get bigger value than the money and the price. Because I cannot imagine that when Google actually will get this kind of filter of the CO2, that people will actually use it because still people are interested in the price and uh, in money. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions online or in the room? There's one question. Go ahead, Ono. <clears throat> yeah, the question is from Mashka Sankova. What are the key differences between newly created Unity Nature Pledge and already existing Unity Climate Pledges and Climate Promise? Question. Thank you. Anyone else in the room? Any questions? However big, however difficult. Yes. Maybe a quick one. Thanks a lot. I'm already good for working uh, in the European Commission um, on the Green Deal. Uh, no, I, I welcome this idea of uh, the pledge for nature. And uh, I was wondering, since, since basically we have to change the way we produce and consume, it is not only about uh, protecting biodiversity within small boxes, but it's about really mainstreaming biodiversity and climate, by the way, across all our operations, policy, and, and finance. And uh, so I just would like to, to know how the Pledging for Nature is going to do that, how, you, uh, how you're going to face this challenge of making sure that uh, your activities are doing no harm to nature, but more doing good. This is basically where we are also discussing within the European Commission. Thank you. Right. Really important hard question. Any others? Oh, uh, cute. Yeah, we got you. There was only one. Yeah. Oh, there's only one. I yeah. Can Some follow up. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. Um, all right. So, you know, do continue to raise your hands if, if you have any other questions. But, uh, Yanis, I think I'm going to give you that 
first question. Um, and then Midori uh, from Nature Page. Yes. And then the third question. Mainstreaming. Mainstreaming. So also for you. Yes. And then uh, other colleagues, if you want to respond on anything, please, uh, other panelists, if you want to respond on anything, please uh, chip in as well. So let me hand over to you first, Jan. Yeah. Uh, the question is uh, up to the point. Uh, so in short, if I would simplify this uh, situation, it's like that uh, production capital is overvalued and over rewarded. Human capital is undervalued and under rewarded and natural capital is in many cases not valued and not rewarded. So all the initiatives which are going like carbon pricing are going in the right direction, but there are many more things which could be done. The typical example is, for example, the tax system. So in the, the until the finance ministers consider that their only job is keeping the budget in in line, they are simply missing the point because they are giving the core signals to producers and consumers. So. Uh, tax the things more which you want less and the opposite the other <laughs> or if you want uh, the biggest hypocrisy in the world or of course the uh, the fossil subsidies if you look to this year's uh, imf report uh, they are the biggest 23 compare or 22 the last figure comparing to the rest so i have been in many governments including european commission and nobody was against removing the these subsidies but nobody is doing it. How is that possible? Mm -hmm. So I think that, and these are incentives, you know, these are real incentives which are telling you go there. Mm -hmm. Then you have uh, green <clears throat> public procurement and all those things. Or if you want tax heavens, how the hell on the earth it's possible that we have a system which nobody is challenging that the rich people and the rich companies can escape and not pay taxes. And we simply live with that. So, you know, it's a lot of those things in the system which are actually incentivizing us in totally different direction. But uh, all the steps which would go in, in, in the right direction would be, of course, more than needed and welcome. So, uh, like it or not, uh, it's still the interest, it's still the, the, the capital which is running the world. And we need to change their incentives so that the things turn in the right direction. Thank you. Midori. And then uh, other colleagues in the panel, if you want to chip in on any of the questions, if you have thoughts. I think this point about youth and how we engage youth uh, is, is an interesting one, if, if anybody also wants to, to engage on that. Um, but clearly business is important. We're talking a lot about finance and changing the incentives for the way money flows. Uh, Midori, over to you. Yeah, so on the, on the first question, uh, climate promise and uh, the signature pledge. So when we talk about nature crisis, we always talk about dual nature climate crisis. And like UNEP, we also talk about triple planetary yeah. crisis as well. So we are fully recognizing the fact that the, all these issues are deeply interconnected. So, you know, here we have climate promise, UNDP climate promise, supporting over 100 countries in raising ambition of NDCs. We will do very similar thing we have been doing already for nature as well, for NBSAP, National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan. Uh, we are supporting with UNEP 140 countries to raise their ambition, their update, so that the, their plans are aligned with the new global biodiversity framework. And we also look at the interconnection between those as well. So from Nature Hub through Nature Pledge, we will contribute to NDC enhancement, for example, by producing a uh, country dossier, which, which looks at uh, entry points or nature-based solutions for tackling climate uh, in the NDCs and, and vice versa. So that sort of collaboration is happening. So we are really trying to, as a UNDP, which works across the SDG areas, tackling multiple development challenges, we are trying to bring the whole UNDP to climate as well as for nature and the interconnection as well. So it's uh, different, but in a way integrated too. And 
uh, mainstream impact. So as I just said, uh, what we are doing, we know that in order to tackle nature crisis, in order to implement the global biodiversity framework, we need to achieve this whole of government and whole of society approach. As long as nature remains a business of Ministry of Environment or just a unit, in the case of UNDP, uh, UN system, we won't be able to tackle all those root causes, uh, which is leading to uh, you know the current biodiversity loss trajectory. So, so in in that sense, you know, it's in a way all about mainstreaming. So, as UNDP, we'd like to be able to also show how we are bringing a whole of UNDP. Uh, you know, we have expertise in health, expertise in governance, gender, and and so on to tackle this nature crisis because we <coughs> understand that nature is a foundation of sustainable development. So in a way, for UNDP to achieve our own goals, you have to look after nature as well. So mainstreaming is very much core and in the production sectors and all other sectors as well. And I might add that we're really looking at how we can change our practices, our business practices, within UNDP to work in this more integrated way, which means moving beyond projects, the more portfolios and system-wide approaches that allows you to look at the interconnected way of addressing problems. Good. Any other reactions to the questions that we heard from panelists? Astrid, please. Yeah, I wanted to, to react on, on two things. I think Jenny, I wanted to speak about youth. So youth in Europe is engaged and active. I wanted to speak about age because the, the issue we have in Europe is not that we have a lot of young people, but we have a lot of old people. And I think on the, the question that you raise on behavior change, I don't think we are factoring in enough how old people think that they are set in their ways, that for many reasons, perhaps their mobility decreases, they have their comfort factors. And I think we're not doing enough to make the alternative choices comfortable and accessible to them. So it's great to say that a you know, plane ticket should be more expensive. But uh, if there is no comfortable alternative to get from A to B, what are people to do? They will still fly. And that brings, I think, uh, the IRP and others, of course, to arguing that we have to look at this at a lot more systemic level. So if you look at city planning, for example, there is no point having cities that are incredibly spread out. People can't get from A to B other than by car. So all of these things are kind of... So that was one thing I wanted to, to mention. And the second point I wanted to just say on what you were saying on the mainstreaming, why that is so incredibly difficult. And it brings us back to Jerry's point of on our education. And the issue is there that I think you, you know, when you contract out interesting projects and the nature-based solution may be the better solution, but your contractors will have studied at universities where they have learned how to build a concrete wall, but not how to develop a complex nature-based solution that integrates the whole ecosystem and et cetera, et cetera. So there, I think, that is something that when, when UNED works with countries, we have to look at all these aspects. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. Um, colleagues online, panelists online, any, any additions from your side? No? Okay. And Yannick? Just one point, I mean, to, yeah. to come back to the point of young people, but also more globally on consumers. I think one, one point which is important is to be able to take the decision you want to take and know the impact you have on, on, on biodiversity and environment, and you, you don't know. So when you buy a new product, when you, when you buy coffee, you don't know the impact you have on a day to day. When you buy even I mean, chips, I mean, some of the potatoes are, are not produced here, less and less uh, in, in Belgium, and you don't know your impact. So it's very complicated to be in the black box. We ignore completely the impact you have on, on nature. If on the mm -hmm. day to day you don't see that, and then we manage in Europe uh, to work on the energy consumption. Uh, so there's a way to go indeed to be able for all of us, all citizens, to know okay, what is my daily impact when when I consume things. What is my impact on nature? I think it's important, and that's what the number of people who are more and more aware of, of those issues are asking for. So we need to shift now into knowing what, what we do uh, every day when, when we consume. Yeah. Because I agree with you, we, we will not change the, the mm -hmm. consumption at all. Can we agree with you? Yes. <laughs> 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 you agree? Well, of, course to say, of course I agree, but of course also we are already going beyond informational energy. So we do a lot 
on for the information for that really legislating as the like to do against false and claims. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, of course, we're then addressing this again more systemically as part of the Green Deal, where we have said we want sustainable products to be the norm, and where we're actually moving based on experience we have from the eco design for, for energy products to legislation that tells us how products can be designed in the environment and company and to make sure that only these are available in the European market. But there, I think there's one more angle we haven't really talked about, and that is, uh, as several of you have said, we need to work more on the consumption side, the in particular, not just on the supply side. But if we do that in a global trade context, and our deforestation legislation is the best example of that, then, of course, we immediately run into problems because of us changing our consumption has immediate consequences for the suppliers and producers at the other end of the road, and it actually contributes to a polarization very often between the global north and the global south, much as we try, of course, as, uh, as um, Carla was also saying, to work with the producer countries to mitigate those impacts and help them um, make uh, comply with our regulation. But this is another factor in this trade relationship, that trade needs to be sustainable, but it's very often difficult for us to address our consumption because on the production side, this is then a welcome Yeah, so, thank you, Astrid. Thank you. That's a very important point and we're very aware of it moving as we move into the SDG summit and the UNGA and all that about these divisions that we see within the world between North and South being larger than ever. So it's, it's really a critical issue how we can uh, bring that cohesion back um, yeah, nice. you want to. Yeah, just since I'm here in the name of the Club of Rome, uh, the Earth for All, uh, this is the continuation of the limits of growth, yeah. which, by the way, was 1972. I'm going to ask you about that in the next five minutes. <laughs> 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 then I will stop here. <laughs> okay, good. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Yannis. Um so let's move into the, the second round of, 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 quest, uh, of questions to the panelists. I mean, we've heard about the commitment with the, the commitment to the global biodiversity framework. We've heard a lot about the reasons why it makes sense to invest in nature. And yet we're seeing still a massive deterioration of, of, our, of our nature and, and, and of our planet. So this next section, we want to focus on the green shoots. So uh, in this segment, we really want to hear some of the priority actions that countries can take to reverse this loss of nature while contributing to the other SDGs as well. Yanis, <laughs> um, you are the uh, a member of the Club of Rome, uh, which has recently published a, for all, a survival guide for humanity. Um, on the 50th anniversary of the landmark publication, The Limits to Growth. So what is the Club of Rome advocating as the way forward for us to reach the global biodiversity targets and the SDGs? You can see my reaction before was, since I was afraid that I will not play my role in time. <laughs> <laughs> so indeed, uh, limits to growth were very clear. So uh, they were already saying that material growth and consumption on the final planet would eventually lead to collapse and decline. What is the difference from that time and now? At that time, that was 50 years ago, it was 3.8 billion people on the planet. Now it's over 8. So the, uh, the Earth for All model, which is actually the continuation, is just going into the system dynamic approach, has two scenarios. One is too little too late. I will not talk a lot about that scenario, you know what? when it's leading us. And another is the giant leap, which actually assumes the fastest economic transformation in history. So something which we haven't yet experienced. There are basically two basic outcomes which are coming from that kind of logic and thinking. First is we will first hit social tipping points before we will hit environmental tipping points. Or in other words, if we do not connect social and environmental story, we will lose both. And the second is that even if we do whatever we want, we will hit two degrees Celsius. And we have to get ready for that. So the storms, the heats, and so on will continue. 
because we have already reached them. Then we have looked to the to the uh, uh, to the social situation, and we included so-called social tension index. And what is the again a kind of uh, finding is that interconnectivity of societies leads to that that collapse in one nation will actually trigger practically the multiple collapse. So we have five critical turnarounds which we are mentioning. Ending poverty, addressing global inequality, accelerating gender equality globally, transforming the food system, and transitioning the clean energy. The, the whole material story is actually pretty much horizontal in that. And then one, mess, one message which is critical is that we need a massive acceleration in the scale and speed of transformative change. If I do three quick conclusions on the biodiversity story, which is in our focus today. First is avoid climate versus nature versus people versus policy versus uh, um, uh, uh, climate nature policy people approach because you need to go uh, to the to the drivers to the natural resource story which is actually pretty much the core through which you can solve all simultaneously of course looking to the necessary system transition of economic models second silos governance of the green dimension should be avoided and replaced with a holistic one we should speed up and deepen our efforts. The best lesson we could learn is from COVID. Yeah. It's really it's really telling us two things. Uh, would you imagine that working from home in 2009 would be possible without COVID today? No. So it means that we took COVID seriously and we introduced something which is now new normality. But it's also telling us that if we, when it comes to climate change, we are not yet taking it seriously. Both are the lessons there. And the last thing is avoid politicization around safe and secure future, because that's what is happening and elections are coming practically in all the countries. But if we will do politicization around that, we will be a kind of uh, losers all over the board. Uh, and uh, I will finish that part with a quote, which I have, which is actually very nicely explaining where is the core of the problem which we are facing. It's from Alan Ford. This is the comics from ex Yugoslavia, which we were all reading. And the, the quote goes something like that. It is not difficult to drive without the brakes. It's difficult to stop. So that's where we are. So we are driving without the brakes. And we are seeing how we are stopping. And uh, we need to start looking how a bit of the brakes would be introduced in, in our aspirations, our everything what we have and think a bit more than on ourselves. Thank you. Um, Midori, you've talked a lot on the, the nature pledge, you've talked a lot about the behavioral shifts needed. Uh, I think today we've talked a lot about the behavioral shifts and we've talked about the financial, the, you know, the shifts in finance, financial models. But can you start telling us a little bit more concretely what kind of shift or, or how we achieve those shifts. Thank you. And uh, this is really all for acceleration upscaling. Yanis just uh, talked about, we really need to see a systemic change in the next three years. Otherwise, by the time of 2030, we might be saying again that we didn't achieve much of the global biodiversity framework targets. So we have to avoid that. So UNDP has been supporting uh, nature conservation uh, at least over the last four decades, maybe even longer. And one of the uh, things we have learned from this is a knowledge and knowledge of the seriousness of consequences of nature loss. Yeah. It's not sufficient. And project by project approach, although each project will be producing useful, very good outcomes, it won't be sufficient by itself. So knowing about problem only becomes useful if it leads to action and profound behavioral change. And in recent history, 
we have seen examples of social norm change uh, triggering massive shift on how people behave. For example, women's right to vote, slavery, uh, smoking in public space, or you know, same-sex marriage. So these beliefs and behaviors around these issues all changed uh, fairly, not always uh, as quickly as we wanted, but fairly quickly and in a big way. And because narratives and social norms around that change, creating a sort of peer pressure for change. So what we are saying under the value shift, the first shift of the three shift we are talking about in the nature pledge is a similar <laughs> major value shift uh, for nature is needed. It's essential if we are serious about achieving the global biodiversity framework, Paris Agreement, and <coughs> SDGs as well. And with this understanding, uh, so under the value shift, UNDP will contribute to stimulate global value shift by changing narratives on nature itself, what nature means to us, nature and economies, and nature and societies, and putting nature in the DNA of everybody in all sectors. Again, this whole society approach is essential. So our strategy on how to go about doing that, of course, we are in a way, you know, uh, learning by doing, but our strategy is multifold. We will support countries, you know, all our work is in countries to fill action gaps for nature, uh, working with a range of partners, including media, civil society organizations, and perhaps advertising and creative sector, for example, and who aim to shift these social norms through new narrative creation, advocacy campaign, uh, supporting local action, and leveraging uh, human rights and legal instrument. And the last one is important also, we need to create and apply legal and human rights and finance related incentives so that destruction and degradation of nature or neglecting sound environmental management will become socially and also economically unacceptable. And this is, also advance really the respect to uh, human rights, to clean and healthy and sustainable environment. I think most of you know about the GA resolution on this. So, so you know, in this sense, you know, this growing sort of ecocide movement which is happening across Europe and is really welcome. And the fact that the EU is also incorporating that concept in, in the uh, update of the law is really, really welcome. So, but lastly, in all these efforts, uh, we are putting really great importance on empowering diverse actors, especially women and youth and indigenous and local communities as an agent for change, uh, which is really critical in this behavioral uh, shift uh, work. And uh, because what we are talking about, I think people have talked about it uh, now as well here, uh, this consumption, production consumption system needs to change and economic and finance decision-making system needs to change. So all those actors need to be really empowered, especially local community, you know, people are there and they are the, really the custodian of, of the natural resources on the ground as well. So that's, another dimension we are putting lots of effort uh, from our side as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. But, you know, going back to what, to what you said, Thierry, you know, if people don't know, they don't have the information, how their crisps, that packet of crisps has been, you know, uh, has affected the, the, the nature and its production, it's difficult for that behavioral shift to happen. So these kinds of regulations that Astrid, you mentioned, are, are really important in that respect. Now, turning to you, Astrid, uh, Midori talked a little bit about the importance of, of regulation. Um, she talked about the, the legal system. Midori, you mentioned the GA resolution on the right to a, a healthy and clean environment is a, a really important step. 
Um, the European Parliament uh, recently voted for the inclusion of ecocide level crimes into the EU's revised environmental crimes directive. What impact will this new directive have in deterring malpractice and causing behavioral changes? How significant is it? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's really very significant. I try to sketch out a bit the, the framework and the legislative proposals that we have made or already have put in place. But of course, now everything depends on implementation. Implementation is largely and unfortunately increasingly undermined by, by, by environmental crime. And that is something that is often just not in the focus of uh, policy makers. But I think increasingly coming into the focus and increasingly it is clear that we have to step up our efforts, in particular because environmental crime is now the fourth largest um, form of global crime. I think that will surprise many. But not only is it the fourth largest crime, it also grows at a rate of 5% per cent every year. And that is actually quite shocking because environmental crime, thereby, as we can see, largely outpaces economic growth. So it, it is a, a, a very significant problem. And I think. That is what we want to tackle in the European Union, but actually with a whole toolbox. So the Environmental Crime Directive that you mentioned, I will just say a word about in a second, is a key part of this toolbox, but by no means the only part of the toolbox. And Carla already mentioned our wildlife action plan, that of course is a very important sort of set of actions that we want to take about, uh, again, addressing the problem at the source. So preventing it at the source, creating the living conditions for people so that they do not have to resort to um, to wildlife crime, our waste shipment regulation, and many other tools. But specifically on the Environmental Crime Directive, so we have made a proposal to revise um, the existing rules, uh, basically to update and expand the list of criminal offenses to strengthen the provision and raising the level of criminal sanctions, to strengthen the enforcement chain, and then also to recognize and strengthen the role of citizens in all of that. So the issue of ecocide that you mentioned, we're not addressing specifically mm -hmm. in, in our proposal. It's a bit of a complex subject. There is no real definition or agreed definition of what ecocide is. And what we've been doing in our directive, we've been looking at criminal offenses that are already identified as criminal offenses in member states. And then we try to harmonize and, and raise the level of sanctions. And I think by doing so, and by um, providing in the directive that uh, the more severe the damage, the more severe the sanction, we are actually making a, a significant dent, or we can make a significant dent uh, in such uh, crimes, and thereby also, in a way, tackle ecocide without making ecocide as such a, a subject. So that was our proposal, but the European Parliament has actually suggested that ecocide should be integrated in the directive and those of you who are not as aficionados, you know that we have a process of negotiations now between member states and the European Parliament in which the Commission acts as the honest broker. So we'll have to see what uh, what comes out of it. But um, so that's the state of the great. Thank you very much, Astrid. Thank you. And uh, um, Tumbo, I'm now going to uh, turn to you. Um, and, you know, it would be really great to hear from, from your country's perspective you know, what are the strategies that you're employing? What are you doing uh, in order to meet your commitments on the uh, the biodiversity uh, framework? A small uh, question, kind of the first one just to place out that. Okay, uh, Matumbo, I'm so sorry. Do you mind, I'm just gonna turn to Carla first and then I'll- Okay. Uh, so, oh, that's uh, fine, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Carla, let me turn to you then. Um, the EC announced uh, the doubling of EU's international biodiversity financing to seven billion dollars, uh, seven billion euros for the period up to 2027. This is really amazing uh, contribution to our collective effort. So, what are your top priorities, and how would you aim to trigger the sort of systemic shifts that we're talking about today? Many, many thanks, uh, Francine. And uh, allow me to say that uh, uh, clearly the, the, the seven uh, billion pledge that you mentioned uh, are uh, there to support the implementation of the global biodiversity framework. 
were announced, uh, I would say, in the run-up of uh, the biodiversity COP, and clear priorities will be to support the global biodiversity framework. Now, we mentioned that our support will be in the framework of the Green Deal and the Global Gateway that we have already mentioned. Uh, when we come to specific priorities, I will say that our action will cover a large spectrum uh, of issue of uh, priorities that are already foreseen in the new global agreement. Uh, I take, for example, our support to the protected and conserved areas management, or to the ecological restoration, the capacity building, of course, or the improving of data system, uh, also, also on the fighting wildlife trafficking. Um, linking to your first question just before, it's clear that for us, we, in all action, in all program, we need to ensure that this biodiversity agenda goes hand in hand with the socioeconomic development. So not really parallel track, but working together on the same, uh, towards the same objective. And if I, just to give an example, I would like to mention the key biodiversity flagship, our Natura Africa, that is clearly built around the structure around three pillars. One is conservation, the second one is development of an ag a green economy, and the third one is the promotion of a good governance of natural resources. If we take just a second example, allow me to mention the Pan-African Lead Green, Great Green Wall Initiative. Probably you know that our Commission of Underline has committed to contribute to this African initiative uh, with uh, 700 million per year. And when we look to this initiative, it's uh, a great example of people-centered, ecosystem-based approach for adaptation to climate change. So the link that the Ioannis was mentioning between climate and biodiversity development people, it's, 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 it's clear there. But I would like to, to come also on your point as to trigger a systematic shift. Um, underline some point that Miduri and um, Thierry already mentioned, because we think that to trigger this systematic shift, we need clearly two elements. One is clearly continue our work on increasing partner capacity. Miduri just mentioned knowledge, we consider knowledge element very, very important and crucial. And this is the reason why we, in our package of action, we continue to support and we create, for example, in African Caribbean and Pacific, a number of regional knowledge center. We establish a global knowledge services center for biodiversity that will be hosted by UNEP and to which the Joint Research Center stand ready, of course, to bring its own support. The second element that I would like to mention that was already rising during this panel is first, the importance of continue insisting on the mainstreaming, the mainstreaming environment and the poverty consideration in the policy, in the plans, but also in the investment. We are putting in place a lot of financial instruments to work on investment. We really need to ensure that biodiversity is fully involved in our investment story. The second, to trigger the, 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 the systematic shift that was already mentioned, is the work on finance framework, on sustainable finance. I think this will be an essential point, and in our side, we will use this amount also to continue to support our partner countries to develop robust financial framework and also to work with the development banks in order to promote the insurance, the insurance of green bonds that I was just mentioning before. Uh, of course, in this context, we're also going to increase our support to the Biofin uh, initiative. Uh, in all this, we really need to join force, uh, to join force with all the partners. And clearly, we expect that also UNDP and UNEP we play a key role on promoting the one UN approach 
towards a natural positive policy and the, and the intervention. We have put uh, many instruments to help on this, and we will uh, continue on, on this. Allow me to mention maybe PAGE, that is a good example of now we can break silos, or also the ACP MEA program or the Poverty Environment Action Plan. I, I, I see as an essential point that UNDP mainstream and continue to mainstream biodiversity into all the relevant sector, including investment. Today, we consider it very, very important that we go beyond the do no harm principle, but really we work towards a do more good approach in everything that we do from policy to concrete investment. I stop here. Unfortunately, I will have to, to leave this panel, but my colleagues Chantal and Aurélie are you in your room and will be absolutely ready to answer to any additional question that will come from the audience. So sorry, but need to leave. Many thanks, Francine, and, uh, and uh, all the panel. Thank you, Carla, and thank you for some really important points there. Thank you for referring to Biofin, which is now a program that's being scaled up to almost all the countries where we work, which is trying to nudge financing uh, an investment to nature and biodiversity, not just from nature and biodiversity circles, but from broader development. How can we nudge public and private sources of financing, mainstream financing, to invest in nature, and also to mentioning the, the UNEP work, um, and we'll talk in a little while, um, I'll ask Thierry to talk about the high impact initiative that is being uh, launched in, in, in New York. But uh, uh, back to you, Matumboy, and uh, give, us a, give us some uh, uh, the reality check at the country level. You know, how do you actually get this stuff done? How are you, what strategies are you employing? What are you doing to, to meet the, the biodiversity commitments? Over to you. Can I thank you um, again? And I think it's um, very enlightening to hear the submissions from the other panelists. And just to zero it uh, in, in terms of, um, our own strategies at Zambia. So for us, I, I could summarize it in really basically five levers that we, we, we have uh, kind of leveraged in terms of developing our own strategy around how we achieve um, sustainability and also um, nurturing our biodiversity. And really the first one for us uh, would be resolve that um, I, I say is intertwined with visionary leadership, and I'll come back to explain that in, in a bit. Um, awareness, which has, um, which I spoke to earlier and has actually been resounded by other panelists in, in terms of um, just how we then build the capacity and also just make sure that people understand that the existing practices um, need to change to sustainable practices. Then number three for us would be mindset shift. And that also has come out as a very key theme to the deliberations we've had here. Number four, I think uh, we're pushing on the agenda of innovating. And uh, then finally, innovating around how we mobilize finances to assist in the transition. So coming back to the first point, which is very, very important in terms of um, the resolve and having the vision and leadership. For Zambia, we are very fortunate that um, the current leadership has deemed it extremely important that we transition uh, intentionally into a green growth uh, economy. And so what we've seen on the ground is an actual establishment of uh, an entire ministry that's called the Ministry of Green Growth, uh, uh, um, Economy and Environment that was established two years ago and basically assigned to uh, drive um, the strategy and the vision of how we do the transition. That for me is extremely important because it then brings, pulls together the different strategies and the plans, the NDSAPs, and also the NDCs to just break it down for the common man in terms of what's this vision, uh, what, what are we really pulling towards? Um, and also that, in, in, in my view, um, goes together with the aspect of uh, putting in place the right policies that then 
actualize even our already existing plans, like the MBSAPs has already mentioned. But alongside that, um, what we've seen the Green Growth Strategy also attempt to do is to um, prompt um, governments to signal correctly. So um, for us, we, we've been lucky to actually even get tax incentives around uh, new markets, such as uh, the green bonds market, where we got a rebate on the withholding tax. And all, all, all these are very important um, steps in terms of having the right strategy of um, how we transition. And, and must I also mention that um, this, this intention on leadership and visionary leadership is also crucial for identifying the right partners. And uh, an example that we would definitely give for ourselves is the partnership we've had with the Biofin that transcended into the development of uh, a very important market, which is the green bonds market and also the development of that framework. Um, in terms of awareness, I think um, I can't emphasize it so much. What we are trying to do is to really attach value to our biodiversity. I did mention earlier that it's an easier conversation because nature for us is really seen as being intertwined to how we are deriving economic value and how we're getting, how we're sustaining much easier than it is for industrialized um, countries that sometimes would not really see uh, nature as an as a next door um, asset that is actually being used to to drive that particular um, economic activity. Then the other um, lever that we, we we are using obviously is the need for that mindset uh, shift. Um, I did explain earlier. Things like charcoal might look small, but they're extremely big um, challenge in our parts as they provide the cheap sources of energy. But, but it's it's a kind it's a, it's an issue of providing the alternative. So if it's not charcoal, what are we encouraging the masses uh, to uh, to look to? And so clean clean energy then becomes um, a, a very important factor. But we all know that to transition anybody or to change people's um, practices from from what what is seen to be cheap, one has to uh, also provide solutions around how that uh, transition will be financed. So um, taking us into the last two of the pillars or the levers um, in terms of uh, innovation and finance, uh, which in fact um, have been a priority for the financial sector uh, that has aimed to really mainstream the green agenda in, in the Zambian financial sector. And basically what we, we see um, is, is, is an important strategy for an economy like ours is to really leverage look inwards and um, take stock of um, what we're endowed with. And uh, for a country like Zambia, we, we really are naturally endowed with uh, a, a vast of um, biodiversity that we feel that um, once we have sensitized uh, the masses enough, the business community, we can harness a lot of uh, as a global green investment hub. So we will showcase that, um, um, you know, in, uh, in, um, green finances that are looking to um, attractive uh, or meaningful investments can actually foster this green growth agenda uh, that we are pursuing as a country. So uh, in summary, I think uh, our strategy has basically um, levered on those uh, five uh, pillars or um, 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 aspects that I've, I've, I've discussed. Um, yeah, and I think I can perhaps um, be there for now. Thank you. I think listening to you, Matumboy, what comes across with the establishment of this Ministry of Green Growth is the leadership choices and decisions that were made, bold leadership decisions, um, and then the establishment of this ministry. So it came from the top, and this ministry worked on all the three shifts that we've been talking about today, you know, the market signals, the you know the regulations and the incentives, uh, the outreach to to people to make these MBSATs, you know, something that people can understand and grasp how to give alternatives to charcoal, uh, uh, and how that brings the the behavioural change. So thank you so much for that example. I think it brings it really down to earth. 
just one sentence on that topic, I think. In policy lead, you have uh, the most difficult is how to choose between urgent and important mm -hmm. questions. And if you have such kind of ministry, then you reserve the place for important questions because normally you would deal only with the urgent ones. And I think it's essential that you keep people in place for dealing with also a bit trajectory question. The longer term, and it's a bold, bold decision. Great. Um, now, we, uh, colleagues, we're going to have a next round of questions. So I don't know if uh, this conversation, I hope this conversation has prompted more questions from you, especially the second segment where we're talking about action, what needs to be done. So please think up your questions. I'm going to go back to Thierry uh, and, then, and then open the floor. Thierry, we've talked a lot about behavioral shifts. We've had some discussion about the financial and economic, but uh, UNEP is, uh, together with partners, uh, launching a high impact initiative this weekend in New York um, on biodiversity, which is intended to get that scale and, and level of ambition and transformation that we're all talking about. So uh, what, what's, what, what's in there? Uh, how do we, you know, how do we transform the economy in, in this radical way that we're talking about? Yeah, thank you, Francie. I mean, the first thing is, is about the fact that Biodiversity has one of the 12 high impacts of the UN, and that was not a given, and, and that's something which is already a great achievement. The, the second thing I'd like to say is about, again, the green shoots and, and, and working with champions. So the initiatives will look at 20 countries in the next seven years and 20 different trajectories, 20 different profiles of biodiversity, because biodiversity here is different than what you have in Zambia. Uh, Zambia is different one from what you have in Cambodia and different from what you have in Chile. And those countries have also different ways of, of seeing the future. And we've not talked about that, but, but the future development is really important in terms of economic development and, and social development. I'll take one example from, from your country, from South Africa. After 100 years, biodiversity has never been so great in South Africa. And then the latest from South Africa, uh, National Biodiversity Institute said that you have more than 400,000 people working on biodiversity related topics. So biodiversity economic works in some countries like South Africa, and we know that. And it's working also, it was working in, in Zimbabwe, it was great to, to chat with you. George on that is working in Namibia, and it can work also in, in Western Balkans. But, but to be fully effective, and it's working so quickly in, in, in Western Balkans, but to be fully effective, you need to have all the elements. And, and the first thing you need to have is you need to have a national development bank who have the knowledge. I mean, Carla was saying about that. Who have the knowledge about why, why is it important to invest on biodiversity? We have completely forgotten, we, we get older, <laughs> uh, we have completely forgotten about the GDP of the poor. A country like Brazil, 20% of the population depend on nature for their survival. So that's what you said. I mean, the, the social heat will be the first one before the environment. So any trajectory we have, we should work first, I mean, with UNDP, with the UNHLC, on, on the social dimension. And then work with the private sectors, private banks, we have a number of front runners who are with us. I will not give names, but you can, you can look at the pledge at, at the CBD Cup of some of the banks and insurance who are now with UNEP and UNDP. So we need to work with them so that they invest because the money needed on biodiversity is huge. We are just providing two or three percent of what is needed. If we don't get those massive investments, forget about getting a whole of new economy, new society. So what we are launching. This we can use that it gives hope and first pathways to have matrix indexes how to work better on sustainable finance and how to address 20 different countries 20 different trajectories and show that this model can, can work in south africa but also in cambodia and other places right thank you very much all right so uh let's open the floor for a second round of questions um uh, yes, George. Thank you so much. And, and I'm, it's a shame Carla is no longer here. I'm using one of her phrases, but she said, do more good. Do, don't think about do no harm, but think about do more good. And linking it back to, I said you made a point as well about sort of our training institutions, our engineers need to be trained differently. And sort of what do we do with a cohort that has only known about infrastructure, right? Um, 
one of the big challenges we've seen, and we discussed it in these last few days with our partners, is what are those bankable projects that actually do more good, right? Not just, okay, it's better than what we had in the past, it doesn't do harm, but it's actually a shift into a do, a do more good, right? Actually a nature-based solution, art, our use. And so the question to the panelists is, how do we get to that pipeline of projects? It's obviously something we're investing in as an organization, but I'd like to hear from you as well. It's like, how do we get there? Because the financing sometimes is actually there, mm -hmm. but then it's the projects that come behind it that are, may I say, disappointing a little bit, right? So how do we match that? Then? That's a really good question um, because these projects need to be large, right? They need to be at scale in order to absorb the kind of finance that banks are, are interested in. So there's no point in having the finance if we don't have the what the, 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 the initiatives, the companies, the smaller, medium-sized businesses that can actually absorb that. So thanks for that question, George. I'm, I see a question here, but I'm going to go online and then go back to you. So, Ono, what are the questions coming from online? All right. Uh, we have here uh, three questions. Uh, the first one is about climate and biodiversity link again. That I've seen IPBS clearly one reducing emissions can contribute to the collapse of biodiversity. How can the nature pledge address this issue? And how can it address climate action that actually causes biodiversity loss? I guess things like the windmills and, uh, mm -hmm. and the other actions. So, uh, okay. should I like read Keep all going. of them? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, the second question is from Simon uh, Cooper Energy shift, shifts and food systems transformation have been named as the most important levers of change confirmed by the March 2023 IPCC report. How can we keep the focus on these major levers rather than less effective measures like carbon capture, which are often proposed by those who also speak about trade-offs, maybe for the same motivation of delaying big change? <laughs> and the last one, uh, more than seeking, this is by Dario Vespertino, more than seeking private finance, we should aim to advocate for and support a shift to business model that while profitable, also becomes sustainable for both environmental and social aspects. We should facilitate public-private partnership aimed at accelerating this change and support government in stable policy reforms that attract private sector investment towards this transformation. How will the Green Deal and Nature Pledge support this paradigm shift? Yeah. I'm not sure if you could catch all of that. <laughs> Just reading it out as well. Okay, so the question, if you want to paraphrase, paraphrase the question, it's saying. Um, so it's basically about the business model, which is profitable and sustainable at the same time. How do we make that shift yeah. in that business model? Under the Green Deal and Nature Pledge. Like what, what are we going to do about that? Okay, great. Thank you, Ono. Thank you for those three questions online and then back Thanks into the room. And you could get a like, book in the UNEP office here in Brussels. Um, I'd like to continue with the thread that George started mentioning, you know, do no harm principle doing good but i also wanted to shift a bit towards the uh, doing harm activities and also to mm -hmm. ask in particular the, the panelists and in particular mr Potoshnik, what do you think uh, could be sort of, uh, the role of, of sanctions i mean we spoke about ecocide but more generally speaking as a, as a sort of one of the policy options in a political of course uh, realm even though of course one uh, we can understand that it might be quite difficult to speak about that in a, in a, in a sort of electorate uh, and, and political electorate campaign altogether. So just wanted to to see uh, with you and, and you know, seek your views as to do this one uh, alternative policy option that also exists as a sanction targeted that, the, you know, those, those those economic actors not really actually, you know, uh, acting towards the doing good or even do no harm. Good, more questions? Yes, please. Um, my question to Mr. Potoshnik. So you talked before of the uh, carbon price and also at the beginning of the doing a price uh, on, on nature. Um, and as you also mentioned how uh, there is an intrinsic value to biodiversity, and therefore often we don't want to put a price, and yet perhaps we have to. Um, when we talk of carbon markets, people tend not to be too emotional about it because it's carbon, it's not the living thing. We can remove carbon somewhere, we can add carbon somewhere else. But when we talk of biodiversity, it completely changes. Because once we have ruled out our investigation avoidance, now there's a residual loss. If we want to compensate for it, then we have to talk about offsets as our biodiversity credits. Um, but there's, of course, a quite, quite a different thing from, from the carbon markets. So how do you think we can, can look into pricing biodiversity while, while taking into account 
the value that the people uh, give to beyond beyond the, the anthropocentric uh, uh, value. Um, and what role do you think biodiversity credits could play in, in solving the, the financial gap for, for reaching the global biodiversity framework targets? Super. Thank you very much. Yeah, I actually had a very similar question to yours uh, about this uh, pricing of nature. And uh, also, I appreciate you talking a lot about the uh, shift in values and uh, uh, that's also required here. And uh, if there's uh, uh, risks in bringing the, the nature into mainstream economic thinking and kind of accepting a rationale that, that uh, might not be uh, appropriate moving forward. Uh, and uh, yeah, if there are risks for this value shift, if we accept the rationale in mainstream economic thinking by actually bringing uh, biodiversity questions into that while accepting the, the kind of, yeah, rational behind doing it. Thank you for that big question. Yes. I can also put a question. Yeah. <laughs> and my question is actually to Mutomboy, uh -huh. uh, because you mentioned about the incentives, and I would just like to ask you to tell a bit more about this incentive that the Zambian government actually put in place, which I think quite courageous related to green bonds. Uh, if you could tell a bit more detail about it to the people in the room, that would be wonderful. Great. Anyone else? Oh, yes. Yeah. I have a short question. So um, about the link between biodiversity and nature preservation with the artificial intelligence, or how can artificial intelligence be harnessed in order to ensure uh, nature uh, protection? Like, for example, there was the Google commitment uh, that was mentioned, and we talked about some, uh, for example, applications that might, might be made to measure the uh, consumer's uh, impact on climate change and so on. So I don't know if there is any work uh, in uh, UNDP or the European Commission, where uh, you are uh, engaging also with the, uh, you know, the startups or the companies dealing with artificial intelligence. And this leads me to the second question. Uh, obviously, given the economic aspect of this issue, uh, what is your cooperation with the private sector and, and how, uh, how does that go for nature uh, preservation? Thank you. Wow. Okay. So <laughs> that's a lot of really good questions. Um, uh, there are questions around how we, you know, do that shift in business models. Uh, so it's about sustainability of profit, about how we get those bank projects uh, investing in nature. Questions around energy and food systems. Questions around sanctions, um, and questions around, you know, the risks around uh, pricing nature and the potential of biodiversity credits. And then finally, very important question around the potential of AI and engagement with the private sector more broadly. So I think there are so many questions and I'm not gonna give anyone any one question, but I, if I just, uh, and the question specifically on Zambia about the incentives that you, um, that you introduced to 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 promote uh, um, more more finance uh, for for biodiversity. So what I'll do is I'll just give you like one and a half, maybe two <laughs> if you've got a lot to say minutes each uh, to pick and choose which questions you want to answer. And so uh, Mutombo, I'm going to start with you. You. I was actually just typing out to ask whether I could start so I could drop off. I need to get into another meeting. Um, so, so the incentive is basically a tax uh, incentive. So if um, you are investing in any uh, bond, including the government bond, you are required to pay a withholding tax uh, of about 15%. So what uh, the Ministry of Finance did, um, started uh, effective this year, is any investor that invests in a green bond would then be exempted from paying um, the withholding tax. And that's uh, uh, essential because uh, it then um, reduces, and the, the, the withholding tax is a final tax of sorts, so it reduces the cost um, on the part of the investors and it was a very strong signal. Um, I hear you in terms of choosing, if you allow me, I'll choose one question before I run off. And uh, it's a question that talks about uh, focusing more to shifting to solar and wind and better food systems. And rather than focusing on um, 
issues of measuring uh, carbon uh, capture, etc. I find that a, a brilliant um, question and also issue to raise. Because really, when you look at jurisdictions like Zambia, it's not like we are heavy in terms of uh, carbon emissions. So I agree that, um, but at the same time, we, we would uh, be shortchanging uh, the, the, ourselves if we went on the trajectory of thinking that uh, just because we're not emitting that much carbon, we should not be seen to be taking uh, responsible actions. So I want to agree that it's, it's far much more beneficial if we can emphasize the need to uh, adopt sustainable practices and maybe uh, not necessarily focus so much on how much um, uh, carbon cap capture measurements we, we're dealing with, because otherwise jurisdictions such as ourselves might just have an excuse of not uh, really shifting into these sustainable practices that will contribute to, to um, uh, reducing emissions on the overall as a globe. So I really thought that um, and I, I comment to that and I just applaud the question, it's really relevant. Thank you, Winston Roy, and thank you very much for your insights and for participating today. It's been really great to have you. Uh, okay, maybe I start at that end, if, if that's okay, and move, move in my direction. So, Yanis, I start with you. Yes, you did it. <laughs> it will be a difficult one. Uh -huh. uh, I will go very quickly through some of the... Uh, first, I'm not uh, an expert on pricing biodiversity, but uh, let me be... It's And it's not easy. That's clear. Um, valuing nature is not easy. But I think with, uh, I'm, for example, not very much in favor of any offsets and so on, because it's just buying and, uh, oh, and, and so that you can continue with. So you have to do the business better, not do the business in the same way and remove it elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I even think that with uh, very strict regulation standards and so on, you basically set price higher costs higher because you demand some of the things, for example, if you introduce it for the mining, that means that people who will mine will have to take those things into account. And that's actually valuing the nature there and protecting it. On the uh, on the national level, it's national capital accounting, where again, the things are moving, moving pretty much in the right direction, but we are certainly not yet there. On the questions which are concerning, uh, uh, concerning sanctions, regulations, so, uh, of course, sanctions are important, as well as regulation, it's important. But I think that the core problem is as long as you send uh, on the market policy signals in one direction, telling consumers and producers, do your business and you can destroy it. And with regulation, just the opposite. What you create, it's a lot of confusion on the markets, a lot of lobbying, and people are eternally lost in that space. So we need to align better the market signals with regulations, and then we will need less sanctions. So that, that would be my point. And the last point, which I would have, is actually emerging from the opening which you have done. Uh, that's this uh, conflict between environmental interests and economic interests. I think it's pretty much artificial story, you know, which people are abusing. I will tell you the best argument which you can use wherever you want. World Economic Forum, it's on a yearly or two yearly basis doing their survey on major economic on major risks in 10 years perspective and you have uh, five categories economic environmental geopolitical societal and technological let me name you this, this is done between the business leaders and let me name you in 10 years perspective what are the challenges which they see first future to mitigate climate change second future to climate change adoption Third, natural disasters and extreme weather events. Four, biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse. Six, natural resource crisis. So among 10, mm -hmm. six are environmental from their business perspective. Mm -hmm. And believe me, none is from the economic category. Mm -hmm. So that's how they see their future. And sometimes we are just hearing those who want to protect their current business interests and are of course louder than those who are comfortable, who are innovative, who work for, these are not loud. And we hear them and then the conclusion many times from policy politicians is, okay, we have to defend uh, that. This is, but, but in many cases, actually policymakers are 
from a strategic point of view far behind where the business actually looks and goes. Well, that's a rather positive note to end on, which is very good. Thank you. Um, Astrid. It was a great choice to have you speak with. <laughs> um, maybe I, I hold in a bit more on this question of shift in, in business models, and because that's actually what the European Green Deal wants to achieve, and that, of course, is, is crucial. And I think there is sort of obviously no silver bullet, but a range of measures that uh, we are taking or envisaging to take, starting, I think, always with uh, and uh, empowering the consumer and having more transparent supply chains. As an example of that, our deforestation regulation, but of course also the corporate sustainability reporting and, and various others that uh, make sure that environmental impacts are made um, open to the, to the public. The second is about making unsustainable activities not profitable. And I think the ETS, for example, is, is a good is, is a very good example of how that can be done in practice. But of course, there's also the famous polluter pays principle and the extended producer responsibility. These are all very concrete measures that can be that can be introduced in order to ensure that business actually ends up integrating the cost of its impact um, on nature. Then there is the perennial issue we have in the European Union called bringing innovation to market. Because our regulations have, I think, triggered vast amounts of innovation. And again, I can take the deforestation regulation. It's amazing what suddenly comes forward in terms of technologies to, to track uh, products. But getting from this sort of inventor, a small, very often an SME was invented, something bringing that to market is always a problem in the community, so something to work on. The issue of finance, so making sure that if you don't do good business, you have less access to finance. So that brings us to the whole sustainable finance policy and to the role of banks and the questions of banks, that, the questions that banks will be asking before they make uh, investments. Of course, there's the role of the state. I think in Europe, we still have 11% uh, state consumption, so to speak. So the role of public procurement make clear that public procurement is, I think, is what we are doing, um, targeting public procurement on non activities uh, non so ensure that companies that get public procurement actually have a lower uh, financial uh, environment impact. I think those are some key issues. And then on this related question, how we engage on that with the, the private sector, uh, I think one of the things we've been doing successfully is building these platforms with the circular economy stakeholder platform. We have a business and biodiversity platform and the pollution platform. I think that is a good way for us to reach out and bring the, the business actors together and enable the most important thing, you know, just for them to listen to us, for us to listen to them, and for them to exchange uh, amongst each other on best practice. We are trying to do this also internationally on in a much smaller scale, but for example, through circular economy missions, where we would be bringing circular economy companies to third countries to meet with uh, government regulators in third countries, but also with other companies so they can build uh, investment relationships. So that's just a, a number of things. And then there's the question of the pipeline, but I'm looking at the bankable projects, which was as in Derek and Nevada. And I saw Chantal noting, so I don't know if you want to yeah. that in there. Well, I think that's complementary to what you were saying, Astrid, you know, having the regulatory uh, framework, that's something that we need to also be looking at in, in our partner countries, is what Yanis was, uh, was saying earlier on. What we've been seeing maybe, and this is Pablo who's asking the question about biodiversity, um, we've got this investment package and creating the pipeline is extraordinarily important. Um, we're not necessarily seeing that what's being proposed is going to be going towards uh, biodiversity or nature-based solutions at the moment. So there, there's a question of maybe um, technical assistance with the banks, um, European, the European Investment Bank, or the, the other um, banks, European banks that we're working with to start thinking about creating pipelines. It's also maybe a question of looking at the instruments themselves because they tend to be geared towards much bigger investments, as was mentioned. Um, and in a lot of the sectors that are really useful for, for biodiversity and nature, we may need much smaller types of, of investments. The, what we're seeing is that the private sector that we're working with in partner countries, their, their, their companies, we're talking about one or two people. 
So we've got to really rethink what we're, who we're working with and what are the types of instruments that we're using. And there, I think there needs to be some piloting. Um, and maybe going back to some old things like the Granin Bank, for instance, and, and linking them up to, to programs that we've been doing um, and developing it differently. So thank yeah. you very much. Thank you, Astrid. That's a great intervention. Uh, quickly to, to Ndori and to Thierry before I hand over to my UNEP colleague to close. It's, um, I'm conscious of time. Um, yeah, around the discussion on pricing, what, what I think is really the nature has to become uh, an asset class, so to speak, just like financial capital, human capital, and man-made capital, which are included in economic calculations, but natural capital isn't totally ignored. So what's happening is, you know, produced capital might have increased uh, a lot, but at the expense of a sharp decrease in the natural capital. So we need to really start equating them as a sort of equally important capital uh, and at least, and start looking at that. For that, you know, we'd like to also support uh, countries in developing, for example, ecosystem accounting systems so that they can, you know, monitor the change in the condition of the ecosystem and their services and and so on. There are lots of other things I'd like to say, but uh, thank you, Midori. <laughs> sure. Um, I hope that addresses a little bit your question. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, I'll take the global picture about what was said, you know, so if it facilitate uh, the conclusion. Uh, we, we talked about the high impact, we talked about the urgency, and it's linked to, to your question on about the risks. And, and the fact that I do believe there's a, a strong investment in insurance in, in those companies who have already understood uh, what, what we need to do and to do more. I mean, if you take the, the, the topic on, on food, uh, well, we are not champion of agribusinesses at that unit, but you partner with us when you need it just to address that because. The window we have is a small one. The, the window to show that it's possible to change the way we work, the way we, we consume is really short. And that's what is driving us to, 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 to show some example that, yes, we can shift in the mindset of the entire generation, the way we see, for example, having a pineapple in Europe and I'll end by a, a smiling uh, reference. During Lucator's having a pineapple, you had a pineapple and you were renting a pineapple to show that you were wealthy in Europe. And that was the way it came from the UK. That was a way to show that you were proud of, of having a pineapple at your place. I hope that in a few years from now, having a pineapple in your kitchen in Europe will be seen as, you know, uh, like uh, drinking alcohol and driving. So having the conscious about what is your impact Mm -hmm. on, on on the day to day because I mean we were talking about the you were saying that yeah we need big impacts no we need small actions small impacts biodiversity is about the small level but thousands of those or millions of those are huge investment huge impact and and we need to, to change that in, in every mindset that's my goal super so Veronica I'm gonna ask you to come up to, to conclude but I think from me just firstly to thank this panel uh, and the colleagues online who, who've had to go, but thank you so much. I put you under a lot of stress with the time and, and you've got questions from everywhere, but uh, thank you so much for participating and, and contributing your, your insights. We really appreciate it. Um, for me, you know, the main takeaways, trade-offs is all thinking. It's thinking of the past. In fact, business is now thinking differently. However, I mean, countries are still moving in that direction, unfortunately. Right? We're still seeing carbon intensive, fossil fuel driven, debt financed growth. That's that's so but but there is there are these green shoots, and uh, we see the green shoots in countries like Zambia, and we see them in in the aspiration of business to to behave differently. Uh, we heard a lot about uh, the importance of changing those market signals that we talked about and incentives so that it actually does cost to harm nature. Uh, that's really, really important. Um, and we talked about the importance of regulation and, and their variables. 
uh, decisions being made uh, and leadership shown both in Zambia, but also very much in the EU around introducing um, those regula regulations to change those market signals and um, change behavior. And so, yes, I hope those behavioral shifts, those thousand tiny uh, changes that you talked about, like the pineapple, uh, can become more and more of a reality. So thank you, thank you very much. I now hand over to Veronica for some comments. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for participating here and online as well. Uh, Francine, thank you so much for such a fabulous moderation. And of course, uh, what a fabulous debate. Uh, I made so many notes myself and uh, it's very hard to, to see where to start actually to, to wrap up this. And I don't think actually we need to wrap up and you did it uh, very nicely, but uh, I will just uh, start uh, saying with like this uh, Astrid Midori, Carla who is not here uh, anymore. Uh, Mutomboy, uh, Yanes, Thierry, uh, thank you so much for this. Uh, so many good thoughts. Uh, and uh, as I said, I will not go through uh, all of them. Uh, but uh, what, it, what was, uh, what was uh, stri striking was that you um, all uh, agreed on a number of things. But uh, it was down to, Francine, what you said uh, at the very beginning, the three key shifts uh, for a transformation, the behavioral shift, uh, the uh, economic and financial systems, uh, policy and practice. And, but uh, tips for where to go from, uh, from now on. Uh, the sustainable finance was uh, was uh, was uh, resonating quite a lot. Clearly, we are in the midpoint uh, uh, to 2030 agenda, but we are certainly not uh, halfway there yet. So we do need to step up the action. We need to recognize, understand more. And this debate was, was very instrumental in, in this. Uh, whole of government approach. I think you all said it's a whole of society approach. Uh, that's uh, something that we heard also from, from Zambia, the uh, Ministry of Green Growth as, as, as a very good uh, example. Uh, nature has to be taken as a political priority. And as some of you hinted, climate change is, is always there. Biodiversity is not political yet. Uh, so, so it needs to be uh, considered uh, uh, as, as such uh, as well. And uh, foresight, long-term thinking uh, of politicians and uh, to trickle down to all levels of decision-making and on the whole level of governance. Uh, so that I think uh, some of you uh, mentioned the trajectory. Uh, the underst increased uh, understanding of how we value nature. Uh, how do we do business uh, better? Uh, in this, uh, also I noted uh, down a look at the whole supply chain, including supply and demand. It was uh, resonated quite a lot uh, here, uh, and rethink uh, of uh, of the uh, of uh, of the economic models. Uh, we should not underestimate the better explanation. Education uh, goes again across uh, uh, all stakeholders, uh, young people, old people, middle-aged people businesses, uh, we, we really do need to work together more how to increase the, the awareness. And uh, what Yanis uh, uh, mentioned, uh, the, to, to address or uh, deep, deeper look deep, much deeper uh, in addressing the, the drivers, um, that, because that's, without that, uh, we, will not, uh, we will not change. Uh, mentioning the whole of government approach, mainstreaming biodiversity uh, across, and uh, and I would say for, for me personally, a uh, very important uh, point that uh, Carla made and lots of you also in a, in a, in a various different ways uh, on the uh, do more good, mm -hmm. the global solidarity. I think I would like to finish with this because that's something that we desperately need. Uh, bigger global solidarity in nature, because nature, as you said, is not luxury. It is essential. Uh, it is uh, essential for livelihoods in many countries, for many, but it is essential uh, for uh, for our survival, for, uh, for, for all of us, uh, whatever region we live in. So this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank, uh, and thank you for the opportunity. Thanks to Camilla and the UNDP team for hosting this uh, event. I think uh, we haven't really discussed that, but it would be good to summarize some of the thoughts uh, that were said here um, without names uh, or with names, uh, whatever will be uh, the, the consensus. But I think that some of the thoughts were really, really fantastic. And uh, 
uh, recommendation that I would make uh, for, for all of us, whether we work for UN uh, or the European Commission, uh, banks, uh, businesses, uh, civil society, is that, uh, that we need to in the global action, but uh, with the vision of the uh, of the, uh, the the continuation of the Green Deal, and if I may also for the future Commission mandate, to uh, to really look at the the European Green Deal externally, internally, with the social dimension. And with this, I really finish. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving me the space. I'd like to 